Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the third workshop of Poema. So Poema is a European uh, network on uh, polynomial optimization. Um, we organize our first workshop uh, physically in uh, Firenze uh, last year. Uh, then the second workshop uh, and the learning week happened online. They were uh, in Constance uh, virtually and, um, and in Amsterdam. And the third workshop um, is um, now online also and virtually happening in uh, at Tinerea Sophia Antipolis. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Geoffrey Zang uh, from Carnegie Mellon University and he will talk about uh, local minima of cubic polynomials. So um, he accepted uh, to talk in this early morning. So thank you <laughs> and please go ahead. Um. All right, thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about uh, local minimum of cubic polynomials. And this is, uh, this is joint work with my advisor at Princeton, Amir Ali Ahmadi. Uh, so just first a recap about what a local minimum is. Um, so we, uh, if we do optimization, we'll all know what the global minimum is. It's like the best possible point among all the possible points. But uh, here we just want a local minimum. So a local minimum is not necessarily the best point in the problem. It's just a point that beats all the other points around it. So if we imagine like this is some functions level sets, and this is our feasible set, uh, we can imagine this point is the global minimum and this point is a local minimum. Again, it doesn't beat every point, it just beats um, other points around it. And why do we care about local minima? So recently there's been this interest in local minima, especially like in the machine learning community. There's this idea that we can find local minima more easily than we can find global minima, or maybe they're like sufficient for some applications. And then uh, what we want to do is we want to more formally understand local minima. And the questions we're going to look at in this talk is um, in the context of cubic polynomials, is a given point a local minima? And does, it, does a given cubic polynomial have a local minimum? And if it does have a local minimum, can we find one efficiently? So again, everything is going to be about cubic polynomials. They're going to be multivariate. They're just polynomials of degree three. And just uh, so for the first question we're going to look at is just deciding local minimality. This is just a brief overview of what's known in the literature about uh, the complexity of deciding if a point's a local minimum. Um, if we have just some uh, quadratic function that we want to minimize, say like this is some least squares problem or something, uh, we just need to check some first order conditions and that's enough to tell whether uh, a point is a local minimum. Now linear programming is another well-studied case. Um, th these are convex problems. So uh, any local minimum is also a global minimum. So then you can just say like, just solve your linear program and then uh, check whether the point you have matches the optimal value. And then there's also some cases where deciding local minimality is intractable. So these are the cases where if I'm minimizing uh, some degree four polynomial without any constraints and also quadratic programming, these are where uh, the degree the objective function has degree two and the constraints are linear and it is actually anti-hard to decide 
whether a given feasible point is a local minimum of that problem. So there's actually one hole here. This is just cubic polynomials. And that is the first question we will address in this talk. Um, so uh, what we have is a necessary and sufficient condition for a point to be a local minimum of a cubic polynomial. So uh, let's say we just have some cubic polynomial P, and then we have a point that satisfies uh, first and second order necessary conditions. These are again just that the gradient of the uh, function is zero and the Hessian is positive semi-definite. So, uh, you know, these are enough for quadratics, but we shouldn't expect it to be enough for cubics. And it turns out that if for cubic polynomials, uh, there's this third condition that's uh, necessary and sufficient for a point to be a local minimum of that cubic polynomial. And it reads that uh, the gradient of the cubic components. So uh, here, when I say P3, what I mean is the cubic component of P. That's what I get if I take my cubic polynomial, keep all the terms of degree three, and throw out the rest. So that's the cubic polynomial, and I need the gradient of that cubic polynomial to vanish on the null space of the Hessian at the point. Um, so don't worry about parsing that right now. I'm going to go through a few examples in the next two slides. Um, so we have some cubic polynomial here, x2 squared plus x1 x2 squared, just a nice normal cubic polynomial. Uh, what does it look like? Uh, so I've plotted the function here. Um, what it looks like is in this region here on the right. It's non-negative. On the region on the left here, it's non-positive. And it's zero on like this cross in between. Uh, so kind of by inspection, what we would be able to tell is that the local minima are is this open half line. This open half line right here, are where the function is zero, uh, but it's surrounded by points that have positive value. Um, so just as an example, we're going to check numerically that this point here is a local minimum. So the first things we need to do are we just need to check first and second order conditions. So this is just that the uh, gradient is equal to zero, the Hessian is positive semi-definite. And then there's this third condition we need to check which is that the gradient of the cubic component vanishes on the null space of the Hessian. Uh, so first of all, what's the gradient of the cubic component? It looks like this. So the this is the cubic component right here. I just take the gradient, it looks like this. So this is the gradient of the cubic component. So what does it mean to vanish on the null space of the Hessian? So here we have the Hessian. It's uh, 0, 0, 0, 2. So the null space of this particular matrix is just the span of the vector 1, 0. Uh, so essentially, it's this line here, uh, which is just the span of 1, 0. And then we need to check whether this particular gradient vanishes on every point here. So what we can do is, you know, any point on this line, we can write as alpha comma zero uh, for some alpha. And then we can just plug that right in here. And then we can actually see that uh, both terms here have an x2 and x2 equals zero for any point on this line. Therefore, this gradient is identically zero on the null space of the Hessian which means that this point, the origin, is in fact a local minimum of this particular cubic polynomial. And uh, that's just one example. So here's an example of a cubic polynomial that does not have a local minimum. Uh, so x2 squared minus x1 squared x2. 
So again, the question here we're going to ask is, is the origin a local minimum of this cubic polynomial? Uh, so first of all, what does this cubic polynomial look like? Uh, so it's kind of split into like this half region here, and then there's like this parabola here. So what it looks like is it's zero on this parabola and zero on the x-axis. And above this parabola, it's positive. Below the, below the x-axis, it's also positive. And between these two regions, it's negative. Um, so the thing here is that the origin is not a local minimum because this negative region actually kind of sneaks in under the parabola. So, uh, what, so if you're at the origin, there's always going to be points that have negative value close to it. So here the origin is not in fact a local minimum. And what's particularly interesting about this particular point here is that um, it's not a local minimum, but there's no descent direction. So what I mean by descent direction is, is I go from is I go out like in any line. And if I only look at like linear paths going out from the origin, the origin is always going to look like a local minimum. Um, so here we can actually see that uh, there's something going on. Or I'm actually going to go through the rest of this example and talk a little bit more about that. So again, here, uh, the first thing we need to do is we need to check first and second order conditions. Uh, the gradient zero, the Hessian is positive semi-definite. It's just the same things as was on the previous slide. So we need to check again that the gradient of the cubic component vanishes on the null space of the Hessians. So we need to find out what the gradient of the cubic component is. Uh, this is the cubic component. So then we just need to write out the Hessian. So again, what's the null space of the Hessian? Uh, it's the same Hessian as before. So it's going to be the span of 1 comma 0. Uh, but the difference here is that when we plug alpha comma zero in, uh, we get this as our expression. And this uh, gradient is not actually identically zero, which means that this point, the origin, is not a local minimum. Uh, so what's going on here? So the idea is that, like I said before, there's no descent direction, but there is what we call like a descent parabola. So it turns out that when the point is not a local minimum, it's not necessarily true that uh, you can find a descent direction, uh, but you can follow along a parabola. And if you follow along that parabola, you'll get points uh, that go uh, that uh, get lower immediately away from the point that you're currently at. And the way you actually try to find this parabola is you follow along the null space and go opposite the gradient. And that's kind, and you can actually write out explicitly uh, what this parabola is going to look like. Um, but the idea is that you go along the null space and go opposite the or and go opposite the gradient, and you can find a uh, parabola of descent. And, and, and that's essentially what's going on with this third condition here. And now uh, I, I, kind of, uh, I kind of talked about how we actually check this condition with this example, uh, but just to put it a little more formally, uh, you know, can we check this condition in polynomial time? Uh, yes, we can. Uh, first, we just have our polynomial, we have some point. Uh, we check first and second order conditions. Those are easy enough. So the next thing we need to do is we need to compute a basis for the null space of our Hessian. Uh, this is just solving some linear system. That's easy enough. And then what we need to do is we need to compute the gradient of the cubic component. And we kind of need to reparameterize. Um, the gradient in terms of like the null space. So what we're going to do is we're going to take x and we're going to write it as a linear combination of all these basis vectors we had. And what we can see is that 
uh, when we evaluate all these expressions out, what we get are a collection of polynomials in alpha. They're all actually going to be uh, quadratic, but um, you know they're they're all going to be polynomials in alpha, and then we can actually check if they're all identically zero by just checking if all the coefficients are zero. Um, so that is uh, how we check whether it points a cubic poly uh, a local minimum of a cubic polynomial. Uh, so before I go on to the next part of the talk, which is actually going to be about finding are these local minima, are there any questions? Okay, no good. There is a question. Okay, no question. Question, question can be uh, written is in the chat also, but I don't see uh, one. Okay. So. Um, all right, so like I said, the next part of the talk is going to be about actually finding these local minima. Uh, so the question again is, can we efficiently find a local minima of any uh, given cubic polynomial? Um, so let's just think about some approaches we might try. So, you know, we learned in, say, multivariate calculus, we just find critical points, we check second-order conditions, and then we just kind of hope that they're local minima, something like that. Um, so let's ask the question, can we find a critical point of any given cubic polynomial? Uh, so that's actually a little bit of a trickier question. So um, it's actually NP hard to decide if a cubic polynomial has any critical points. And the proof is actually pretty short. Um, the way you would see this is, uh, you know, if you're trying to find the zeros of, of the gradient of some cubic polynomial, that gives you a, a system of quadratic equations. Now, this is essentially becomes a quadratic satisfiability problem. Um, quadratic satisfiability is, you know, pretty notoriously hard to solve. And you can construct a reduction pretty easily from this. If I just have some collection of quadratic equations, I can make some cubic polynomial that looks like this. And the gradient of this particular cubic polynomial is just going to have uh, all the um, quadratic equations I had before. And then trying to find the zeros of this gradient require you to solve that system of quadratic equations. Um, so this doesn't actually say, you know, explicitly, yes, there, uh, you can't find critical points, but this is, this kind of lends itself to the idea that maybe, you know, looking for critical points isn't the way to go. So what are we going to do? So here's the question. Can we find second order points now? This might be a little bit unintuitive. Uh, you know, if we can't find critical points, why should we be able to find second order points? So there's actually something very special that goes on. And this is the general approach we're going to do. We're going to make our non-convex problem convex. So there's actually a very interesting fact about uh, second order points of cubic polynomials. Um, they always form a convex set. Now, this is actually the maximal degree for which this statement is true. So if I just look at, say, some degree 4 polynomial, a you know, fairly simple degree 4 polynomial here, it is two local minima, uh, minus 1 and 1. And as you can see, the set of local minima is not a convex set. But it does turn out that the set of uh, sec second order points of any cubic polynomial, they do form a convex set. And just as an example here, I have some cubic polynomial. Um, these are its critical points. As you can see, not a convex set. However, if we 
look only at the points where the Hessian is positive semi-definite. That's these points here. We can see that we are let if we you know only look at critical points where the Hessian is positive semi-definite, we are left with a convex set. And incidentally, in this case, uh, you know, these are the second order points, which also happen to be the local minima. Um, so there's actually something even more special we can say about the second order points of any cubic polynomial. They form a spectrohedron. Um, so the rest of the talk is going to be talking about this. The cubic, the second order points of any cubic polynomial form a spectrohedron. And just to put this into perspective, um, you know, the second order points of any quadratic polynomial, they form a polyhedron because, you know, you're solving for the zeros of the gradient that gives you a system of linear equations. And the solution there is always going to be a polyhedral set. So, like, you know, quadratic polynomials. Uh, polyhedra, cubic polynomials, spectrohedra. Uh, so it actually also goes the other way. If I take any spectrohedron, um, something like this, it's actually the projection of the second order points of some cubic polynomial. So just as an example here, I have some arbitrary spectrohedron in two variables. Um, and there is actually a uh, four-variate polynomial. Um, it looks like this. If I look at the second-order points of this particular cubic polynomial and project it onto the x1 and x2 space, I get exactly this spectrohedron back. Um, and the consequence of this is that solving semi-definite programs is at least as hard as finding second order points of cubic polynomials. And kind of the implication from the last slide was that uh, finding second order points of cubic polynomials, uh, you can do that with an SDT. Um, so what this kind of establishes is that the complexity of these two problems, which is just the uh, solving SDT and finding second order points of cubic polynomials, they actually have equivalent complexity. Um, all right, now that's a pretty interesting fact, but I still haven't told you how we're actually going to find these local minima. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to solve a quote-unquote convex problem. Uh, so what does this problem look like? It's going to be uh, we're going to minimize some, our cubic polynomial over the set of points where the Hessian is positive semi-definite. So why do I call this a convex problem? So the first thing to observe is that um, what is the feasible set? So if I have a cubic polynomial, um, what is the Hessian? It's going to be a matrix but it's going to be a matrix that is linear in my variables, you know, because I have a cubic polynomial that's degree three. I take the Hessian, which means I drop the degree down by two. So I get a matrix that is linear in the entries. So I have this problem here. Um, you know, uh, this feasible set here is actually a spectrohedron. And then I'm minimizing a function that looks convex over my convex set. So that's what I mean by this is a quote unquote convex optimization problem. And then the you know, and then the theorem here is that um, if a if my cubic polynomial has a second order point, uh, the solution set of this particular problem is exactly the set of second order points. And the idea here is kind of like if I look at a univariate cubic polynomial, let's say it looks like this. Um, what does this um, feasible set look like if we're dealing with a univariate cubic polynomial? It's just going to be uh, this half space here. Again, this is the set of points where my function looks convex. And if I minimize my cubic polynomial over this particular set, I get exactly this point, 
and this point is the second order point of this particular cubic polynomial. And then uh, you kind of need to extend this to uh, multiple dimensions. And then you're constantly using the fact that if I have a cubic polynomial, it's only going to have at most, it's either going to be like the trivial, like x equals or y equals zero, or it's going to have a singular second order point. And that's kind of the idea behind the proof. Um, you know, that's nice and all, but again, we still need to solve this problem. Uh, you know, this is a pretty funky looking thing. Uh, you know, how might we go about solving it? Um, you know, you could technically, I guess, try your favorite convex problem solver. Um, you could try an interior point method. You could try a ellipsoid method. Uh, they might work, but uh, the way that um, we found that does work is using sum of squares. Uh, so I'm just going to go into a brief overview of sum of squares polynomials. Uh, so the idea behind sum of squares polynomials is we want to be able to answer this question, is a polynomial non-negative? And you could look at this polynomial, you could stare at this polynomial. Uh, you could try to, you know, plug in a bunch of points and try to hope that you get some point where the function is negative. Um, you know, but eventually we want to be able to say whether or not this polynomial is not negative. And if I give it to you like this, it's going to look a little tricky. Um, but the idea here is, what if I told you that I could rewrite this particular polynomial like this? Then you would be able to say, well, you know, there's a square here, there's a square here, and there's a square here as well. So this polynomial is what I call a sum of squares because I can write it as the sum of squares of other polynomials. So that's this definition here. Um, again, a polynomial is what we call SOS if it can be written as the sum of squares of other polynomials. And there's really uh, two main, two things you really need to know about sum of squares polynomials. The first is that they're non-negative. Uh, again, because they're the sum of squares of non-negative quantities, therefore they're non-negative. And the second, Probably the second most important thing to know is that uh, um, if a polynomial is a sum of squares, we can tell whether it is by solving a semi-definite program. And this is true even if we don't necessarily know the coefficients of our polynomial. So this, you know, if I were to ask for what values of a, B, and C, is this polynomial non-negative, I would be still be able to answer this question using some indefinite programming. And uh, in terms of polynomial optimization, probably the way this pops up is what we call sum of squares relaxations. So the idea here is we want to find lower bounds for optimal values of polynomial optimization problems. So uh, here, is, so the idea is this. So we want to minimize some function p. And the optimal value of this is the same as the optimal value of the problem on the right. So what's this problem on the right? This problem on the right, you can interpret as trying to find the largest lower bound on the function. So we're just looking at p of x minus gamma, and then we're trying to push gamma as high as possible so that this polynomial is not negative. And of course, the uh, highest possible value it can be is just the infimum of your particular polynomial. So what's a sum of squares relaxation? Well, that's just we take this non-negative non-negativity constraint, which is actually NPP hard to um, impose, and then we replace this with what we call a sum of squares constraint. So um, instead of requiring this p of x minus gamma to be a non-negative polynomial, we just need it to be a sum of squares. And this problem on the right becomes an SDP. 
And if we need a, a constraint problem, it's going to look something like this. So the, again, the problem we want to solve is this problem here, minimize p of x, such that the Hessian of x and p is positive semi-definite. And this problem on the right-hand side here gives us a lower bound on the optimal value here. Uh, so why does this problem on the right give us a lower bound? So this problem here is we want to maximize gamma such that p of x minus gamma equals sigma of x plus the trace of the Hessian of p of x times this matrix s of x. So sigma here is, uh, we want this to be a sum of squares. It's actually going to be quadratic. And then s here is, we need it to be what's called an SLS matrix. So this is, uh, you can write it as the outer product of some matrix. So uh, the thing about SLS matrices is they're always going to be positive semi-definite. So why does this give us a lower bound on the optimal value of this optimization problem here? So let's just take any x where the Hessian is positive semi-definite. And let's suppose that we had sigma and s such that this um, identity holds. So p of x minus gamma is some non-negative quantity because again, sigma is SOS, it's always going to be non-negative. And then the trace of the product of two positive semi-definite matrices is always non-negative. So as long as the Hessian net of P at X is positive semi-definite and uh, S is always positive semi-definite again. So this quantity on here is always going to be non-negative as well. So P of X minus gamma is always going to be non-negative on the feasible set of this problem here. And essentially that means that gamma is a lower bound on the optimal value of this problem here. Um, so again, that's just this. This problem on the right gives us a lower bound of, on the optimal value of this problem on the left. And it turns out that uh, if P has a second order point, uh, this SOS relaxation is actually tight. Now, uh, if you've worked with some of squares relaxations before, you know, some question you always need to ask is like, um, you know, what level of the SOS relaxation do you need? You know, so here it turns out you just need the first level. That's where um, sigma is a quadratic polynomial and this matrix S um, is a matrix of quadratic polynomials. So, so you don't need to go to all these high levels of any SOS hierarchy where the size of the problem gets really, really big, you just need the first level. And that's great. And the proof is um, fairly simple. If I have a second order point, I can actually produce a solution to this problem on the right-hand side here. That gives me the best possible value. Um, the way that, um, the reason this works is that this polynomial on the left-hand side here is actually sum of squares and this polynomial on the right and, and this matrix on the right-hand side here is actually an SOS matrix because again I can write it as the outer product of some other matrix of polynomials. And, uh, and that's nice. You know, we know that if our polynomial has a second order point, then our SOS relaxation is going to be tight. Um, you know, but we still need to get a solution out of it. If we have just a lower bound, that doesn't actually necessarily give us a second order point. So then, you know, can we actually get a second order point out of this? And turns out you can. So, um, we want to recover a second order point, and we're just assuming that we have in hand a, a solution. So that's this sigma of x and there's and this s of x here. Let's just assume that we solve their SOS relaxation and then we have a feasible point. 
So we actually want to find this x, and the way we're going to do that is here again, because gamma is equal to the uh, value of p at a second order point, the idea is we want to find the zeros of this right-hand side here. So that's kind of like solving this uh, optimization problem here. Um, we need x to be, the Hessian of p at x to be positive semi-definite, and then because uh, this is the sum of two non-negative quantities, uh, we need both of them to be identically zero. Uh, so these are some non-linear constraints. So this is some linear matrix inequality. This is a quality of some quadratic polynomial. If you multiply this out, you get some cubic polynomial. So we have ourselves an LMI, a quadratic equality constraint, and a cubic equality constraint. Um, so the, what we're going to do now is we're going to try to linearize all these constraints. Uh, so let's just start with the first one. So this is the linear matrix inequality. As long as we're dealing with SDPs, then this is perfectly fine. Uh, the second constraint, well, we know that sigma is an SOS quadratic. It's convex. So actually, uh, Finding the zeros of this particular polynomial is actually solving a system of linear equations. Again, that's totally fine. Uh, so what about this third equation? So that's a cubic equation. Um, I personally don't know of any general method of solving a cubic equation, um, but uh, turns out this is not just any cubic equation. So the observation to make here is that s of x has, uh, we can write a Cholesky factorization. Again, here, this is just some matrix R of polynomials. And then we can write s of x as R of x, R of x transpose. And then um, actually, because these are two positive semi-definite matrices, uh, the trace of their product is going to be zero if and only if the, this matrix times R of X is zero. So here we have ourselves a quadratic equation. And then uh, equivalently, this is saying that each row of, or each column of this matrix R is, belongs to the null space of the Hessian of the matrix. Um, so this is just some quadratic equation and we need to somehow find the zeros of it. And the fact that we're going to use is this, uh, that all matrices in the relative interior of a spectrohedron have the same null space. So again, the constraint we want to impose is that each column of this matrix, again, so these are vectors um, whose entries are linear pol or are affine polynomials, belongs to the null space of some matrix whose entries are also linear in the uh, in, in some variables. So what we can actually do is we can replace this part here, the null space of some matrix, which is actually variable. Uh, we can actually replace that with just some fixed matrix it's because um, Again, this point is in some spectrohedron. Uh, again, because we wanted the Hessian of P at X to be positive semi-definite. So what we can actually do is we can find some point in the relative interior of this particular spectrohedron. Just fix that point and we can impose this constraint here instead. That each column of our matrix R belongs to the null space of some fixed matrix. And really, um, you know, again, uh, just skipping a lot of the details, the takeaway here is that, um, you know, belonging to the null space of some particular matrix is actually just a linear constraint. So what we've done is we've taken this cubic equation and we've turned it into a bunch of linear equations. Uh, so this problem we had here, which looked nonlinear at first is actually an SDT. Um, you know, so in the end, 
uh, we solve our SOS relaxation. That's one SDP. And we can actually solve a second SDP to actually get a second order point of our cubic polynomial. Um, so actually it does turn out that we can do a little better. So uh, remember the proof I had before, um, you know, if we have a second order point of a cubic, if our cubic polynomial has a second order point, we actually know exactly what uh, some solution or some optimal solution of that uh, problem looks like. It looks like this. So, you know, skipping a few of the details, you know, what we're, well, what's going on is we're going to substitute some coefficients and then apply an SDP rank relaxation. So if we parameterize our cubic polynomial by uh, some matrices H and Q and some vector B, um, you know, this is actually all you need to parameterize a cubic polynomial, the SOS problem I had before ends up looking something like this. Uh, it's kind of big, it's kind of ugly, um, you know, but it turns out to be, you, you can do some really cool stuff with this. You know, so something we always like to do is, you know, we have our SDP here, and then we really like to take the dual of things. So the dual of this particular problem you know, looks like this. Again, it's kind of big, it's kind of ugly, um, but it actually looks really similar to our primal. And it, you know, if, you know, it, so you don't need to pay attention to the specific entries, but really um, the idea here is if I add this extra constraint here at x equals z, um, what I get is this particular SDP here. And now this looks really similar. Now these two SDPs are looking really, really similar. So again, here we have, you know, we have our primal and then we have our dual. And then what we're doing is we're adding an extra constraint to our dual. So again, that actually lowers the optimal value. So if you had no duality gap before, you might have a duality gap now. Um, and the actual result here is that if these two SDPs have zero duality gap, then your SDPs have a second order point. And uh, so this is actually what it actually looks like in theorem form. So, you know, you don't need to actually pay attention to this big, ugly expression. Uh, you can go ahead and confirm that this is in fact a uh, valid uh, spectrohedron. Um, but this is the theorem. So if I have a cubic polynomial, I can, you know, you give me the coefficients of this cubic polynomial and I can give you a semi-definite representation of its second order points. So like no optimization, no nothing. So like the previous approach I had before, um, you know, I solved an SOS relaxation and then um, I did some extra work, some Cholesky factorizations, and I could actually give you a semi-definite representation of the second order points. Uh, so that, what I had before, actually proves that it's a spectrohedron. This actually lets me tell you exactly what the second order points are without needing to do anything else. So again, uh, you know, given the coefficients of some cubic polynomial, I can ex write out explicitly a semi-definite representation of its second order points. Um, so great, we can find second order points of cubic polynomials. And you now the title of the talk is on local minima of cubic polynomials. So I still need to talk about the local minima. So before I do that, I'm just gonna talk about the relative interior of a set. Uh, so what's the relative interior? So um, if I imagine say like a piece of paper in R3, um, you know, you can think of it as a like two dimensional object in R3. If you think of it as like a two dimensional object in R3, then it's 
not a full dimensional object. It's not going to have an interior. Uh, but if I think of the piece of paper as a two dimensional object, it will have an interior if I think of it, you know, in the space of R2. I bring that back up to R3 and that's the relative interior. So this is like, I'm gen, so this is like a generalization of the interior to, uh, sets that don't have full dimension. Uh, so why am I talking about this? So if a cubic polynomial has a local minimum, then the set of its local minima is exactly the relative interior of the set of its second order points. Um, so you know, on the previous slide, I had a semi-definite representation of the second order points. Now I just need to get a point in the relative interior of that set and I have a local minimum. And turns out that there's a pretty simple procedure you can use to find the local minimum or a, a, a point in the relative interior of some set. So how it works is I have some set. Uh, I What I do is I pick some you know coordinate, let's say x1. I minimize along that coordinate, maximize along that coordinate. And then what I do is I fix that coordinate to literally anything in between. So let's just say this. So now I am working with uh, the restriction of my original set to points uh, that have the x1 coordinate that I set. Now I move on to the next coordinate, x2, and maximize and minimize along x2. I get some values and I pick anything in between. And if I do this for all the coordinates, I get a point in the relative interior. Um, so, you know, again, you should think of this pink set as the set of second order points of some cubic polynomial. I can optimize over that using SVPs because I have an explicit semi-definite representation for it. So, you know, I get my second order points. I do this procedure on it and eventually I get a local minimum. Um, so again, just the takeaway. Uh, from this talk, if I have a cubic polynomial, I can test local minimality in polynomial time. And even though it's NP hard to decide if a cubic polynomial has a second order point, if I look for er, to, whether it's a, it's a NP hard to test if a cubic polynomial has a critical point, if I look, you know, if I skip that and look directly for second order points, I can actually, you know, pose that problem as an SDP, and then I can find the uh, local minimum of cubic polynomials uh, tractably. Um, so that's the end of the talk. Uh, thank you all for listening. Um, you know, if there's more, every, uh, the, uh, the preprints here, and then, uh, you know, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you a lot for your nice presentation. So do we have uh, questions? If you have questions, it's, yes, you unmute your microphone. Hi. Yes. Hello. Have a question? Okay. Hi. So uh, I have a question about uh, the following. So you have said that, uh, so basically as a set of second order points uh, is a spectrohedron, right? So in yes. particular, it's convex set. and in, on your picture, when you uh, show that this uh, second order points form like, uh, let's say, half space, uh, I think it should imply that uh, if, it ha if, a, if a cubic polynomial has a unique uh, local minimum, so if, if it has finitely many, let's say, critical points, then it has only one local minimum, right? Uh, yeah, so you can actually say something a little stronger. So. Um... So oh, it actually, so if your polynomial depends, let's say, uh, on n variable without, you cannot write it as polynomial in less number of variables, then you can have only one local minimum, right? Yes. Yeah, so, um, so you can actually, so, uh, most of the, if I take, you know, any random cubic polynomial, first of all, it's probably not going to have a local minimum, but if it does, it's actually probably going to be the strictly unique local minimum. 
So, and uh, the way you'd be able to tell is that the Hessian would be positive definite. So like if you actually, so if there is even any point where the Hessian is positive definite, you're not going to have this case where the local minimums are not unique. Right, so basically you're always dealing with one point, right? When, yeah, whenever you, you're usually only dealing with one point. You know, but uh, if you have, you know, so there's, you know, interesting cases where that's not the case. So particularly if you're dealing with polynomials like these, you know, uh, these are specifically, I start with some spectrohedron, and then I want to find the cubic polynomial where the, uh, you know, that spectrohedron is the projection of the second order points. These polynomials are not going to have unique local minima. Mm, yeah, it, it's going to be the whole line or like the whole subspace, right? Yeah, exactly. Yes. Thank you. Uh, no problem. Thank you for the question. Other questions? <clears throat> Hello, good morning. Maybe I would like, I'm Monique Laurent. Maybe I would like to ask a, a quick question. So, what when you give uh, complexity results in what uh, um, uh, model of complexity are you working is it in the real model or in the bit complexity for instance when you say that checking if a, a point is a local minimum can be done in polynomial time uh, yeah so there's actually a so there's there's a bit of nuance here so when we say this so this statement here is in so this statement here is in the Turing model. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in bit complexity, you're given a point where we say it has like rational coefficients, and then you know if you follow everything uh, here, essentially there's you need to check one PSD. You can do that in polynomial time, and then you need to solve some linear systems, do some addition. You know, all that all that's perfectly nice. Uh, so here, unfortunately, it gets a little tricky. So, um, you know, here we say that SDP and second order points have essentially the same complexity. And so all those not nice things you encounter, you know, when you talk about like SDPs in the, in like any sort of bit complexity model, the same issues are going to carry over to the second order points of cubic polynomials. Okay. Okay, S thanks. Thanks a lot. No for, problem. For clarifying. May I ask another question? Uh, go ahead. So, w when you had this uh, um, characterization, when you explained that uh, how to go from the cubic to the to the linear case, because it's. Uh, um, so that's. How to recover a second of the point. Uh, this? Yeah. Yes, I think so. Then you explain that this condition, uh, the trace of S times uh, Hessian equal to zero could be reduced because then you said, well, uh, uh, it's enough to check if it is the kernel of a point in the interior. Yeah. But what if the point you search, because the kernel of a point in the interior is the smallest possible. And, yeah. and what if the X you are searching in the end lies on the boundaries and it's a kernel is bigger? Yeah, so that's this plus some analysis step here. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so, so you use the fact that you can write that point on the um, exterior as the limit of some points in the interior. Yeah, because we're every you know we're working with spectrohedra here, so like, you know, everything's a closed set. Uh huh. Okay. So you took care of that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That that that's the step right here. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, yes, I, I have a question. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. So, so, so when you characterize the the, the the cases in which it's easy to check if one point is a local minimizer, so can you go to the first uh, slide? Yeah. Probably, yeah. Please, the second one. There's a, there needs to be a faster way to do this. Uh, this this one. Yeah. So yeah. So my question is: If is there a um, a polytope or a polyhedra such that the quadratic programming in the quadratic programming is tractable? 
Um, so even if you're looking at like the simplex, then no, like the, like even if it's just straight up X is non-negative. Um, so like, for example, uh, one of the reductions I know is from like matrix scope positivity. So that problem is literally just a uh, minimize X transpose QX such that X is non-negative. Um, so like testing copositive copositivities NP hard, and then you can, you know, determine that by solving some quadratic program that's like super simple to write down. Yeah, yes, but checking a local minimal is also difficult, right? Yeah, yeah, so the, it, you would check if the origin is a local minimum. Okay. Thanks. No problem. Um, I have a question. Uh, so in your formulation with the... Um, with the, the matrix S, which is uh, semi-definite positive. So you, you, you have this uh, SOS uh, formulation, yes. So uh, if you take, and you say it's, um, it's tight in this degree. Yeah, uh, so if, if, if there's a second order point. Yes. If you look at the, say the dual problem, which I think you do after more or less, yeah. So can you recover from the dual solution? Uh, the, um, so the dual optimum so, the solution you want. Um, so, uh, so I never actually looked at that particular dual because I never, I didn't end up needing to. Um, so, like this is something that's. So this is something that's close to what the dual would be. Hmm. Um, except here, what I've done is I've restricted the coefficients to have some particular structure. And then, um, er, er, so this so this actually, if you like unwrite it out, is just like the, um, it's just minimize P of X such that uh, the Hessian's positive. It's just like um, essentially this, so it's the dual of the initial point. Yeah, yeah. So like this, I, I mean, like when you do an SOS problem, you're just writing essentially the dual of this. So except you have a rank one condition. So yeah. So here, what I did to get this particular problem is I, you know, I I want to look for solutions that look like this. But then you would get some quadratic equality constraints. So what we did is we threw an SDP rank relaxation on that. And that's like kind of where this constraint comes from because we had a rank relaxation. Yes. Thank you. No problem.